we will get started. Um, my name is Melanie Johnson, and I'm the president of the Adirondack Research Consortium and a professor at Paul Smith College. Um, we'd like to thank you all for joining us for our fall webinar series, Meeting the Demands of Changing Climates, um, sponsored by Paul Smith College and the Adirondack Research Consortium with um, support from International Paper. Um, we will be, as you can see, you're all um, muted and um, aren't able to turn your cameras on. We have the chat that you can use if you wanted to say like hi to people or, or say um, thanks for doing this, Kurt. Um, if you have questions you'd like Kurt to answer, please put those in the Q&A. Um, after Kurt's presentation, we'll um, take some questions. And if there's more questions than we have a chance to get to, um, we will put those up on the ARC website. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And over to you, Kurt. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming and thanks for having me ARC. Um, I'm gonna get rolling here with the screen share and I'll, I'll start to talk that way. We'll just make sure I can get this to work. Yeah. Okay, so what I'd like to do um, for the next 40, 45 minutes, something like that, um, is to just review the latest information we have about um, changes in climate in recent decades up here in the Adirondack uplands and also um, give you a little bit of information about what we're finding out about what it means. So we hear a lot about climate change, but not necessarily what place-based impacts might be like. And uh, we're just starting to get some results from long-term monitoring studies here at Paul Smith's too. So I'll just give you little teasers about that kind of stuff. It's basically just an update on, on what we know. So I'm going to switch slides here. Okay. so. Um, I'm assuming I don't need to belabor this point, but uh, uh, there is really no remaining serious controversy in the scientific community that um, in recent decades, um, humans are definitely affecting global climates. Uh, most experts think that, although uh, sometimes you still run across, uh, believe it or not, some folks who still continue to deny that. Um, I'd like to sort of launched this whole presentation about the Adirondack uplands in the context of this, where uh, one of the lingering arguments from uh, people who say that climate change is not being caused by people is that the weather records we have uh, are influenced by the growth of cities. It's called the urban heat island effect. And it's just the basic idea that if you cut down the forests and fields and things and put up cities, then um, it absorbs more heat and so the temperature goes up. And so weather stations are biased. They'll show a, a warming, not because the climate is warming, but because the cities around them got bigger. So um, one of the antidotes to that argument, of course, is to go to a place like this, All right? So we're in the Adirondack Uplands. Uh, I've got three stars here for uh, three weather stations that are part of the US Historical Climatology Network, very carefully vetted. Um, the data are online and updated frequently. Um, so that'd be Danamora, Tupper Lake, and Indian Lake. Um, that's going to be the framework for the evidence we've got at Paul Smith College for ways that the changes in climate are affecting the ecosystem as well. Um, this is part of a paper I'm now working on with a student, uh, Skylar Murphy, who just graduated last year, and Brennan Wilsey, who's a colleague here. Um, so they're helping crunch the numbers and do the stats and things like that as well. So here's when you just combine those three Adirondack upland stations, temperature records for the last 120 years. So if you read from left to right, uh, the combined average shows an increase in the temperature. In fact, it's uh, a little bit faster than the global average too. So uh, this can't be blamed on a heat island effect. It's up here in the mountains. Um, the Increase in warming is particularly notable since about the 1970s. And that really makes sense too, that um, since about the 1970s, we've seen the human impact on the climate increasing relative to the other two big factors, which would be the sun's output and volcanic activity. Um, since we've been monitoring those, really if, if it were not for the human presence, the temperature in recent decades should just sort of bounce around kind of on a flat line. Uh, this increase is clearly attributable to the release of fossil fuels by human activity or fossil fuel emissions, right? Carbon emissions. So the big picture scene is um, as we warm up here and continue into the future because 
those greenhouse gases are not going away quickly. Uh, we're basically seeing a trend uh, where we'll have a shift in the kind of climates we have here to be more and more like climates farther south. And so one of the ways that many people have described this is as if the Blue Ridge climates were moving up here to the Adirondacks. So we could make an argument that, well, I mean, the Blue Ridge is beautiful too, right? In its own way, and people like going there and they don't feel miserable to live there. Um, but it also then raises the questions of why are the Adirondacks different from the Blue Ridge? And uh, so we'll get into that. This, this brings humans into the picture as well as part of the ecosystem and part of the landscape. So the basic thing that's going on, as I'll show you in a few temperature charts in a second, is um, before we had uh, summer and winter somewhat evenly splitting the year, the, the, the warmer times above freezing anyway, uh, were a bit more than half of the year and then the winter. Uh, what we're seeing as the, as the climate increases is we're getting more summer and less winter, uh, both in terms of duration and intensity. It's getting longer and hotter summers and shorter and milder winters. So um, here's some of the information we've been picking out by uh, taking not only the annual averages of temperatures at these three stations combined, but also teasing out the individual months. And so I've got a bar chart here of uh, the 12 months of the year. And I'm gonna go season by season here, uh, showing the amount of warming in degrees Fahrenheit since uh, 1970. So I wanna start with winter here. Um, so we've got December, January, February with uh, four to five degrees Fahrenheit of warming since 1970. So uh, what does that all mean? Well, uh, we were just talking about, about the Blue Ridge, right? And um, what's wrong with the Blue Ridge? Well, nothing really, but uh, it doesn't belong up here, right? Um, so I've talked to people around the area, as I'm sure a lot of you have too. This is Chuck Bruja at the Mountaineer uh, Outdoors uh, Sporting Goods Store. And I stopped one time and, and said, you're a supplier of people who go out in the woods here. And uh, what does this mean to you? Um, as an Adirondacker and a person in the outdoor sports industry, uh, what does it mean to you to have it be warming up? And he said, uh, where we live defines who we are and winter defines the North Country. And that really made me think about this. So really the, a lot of our identity is about winter, even when people are up here in the summer. I mean, myself, when I tell people elsewhere where I live, I say I'm in the Adirondacks and they say, well, what, what or upstate New York or something. And, and then I say Lake Placid and that's where the Olympics were. Oh yeah, everybody knows. It's a huge part of our identity, things like that, the winter sports. Um, we've also got, you know, a winter sports industry with skiing and snowmobiling and ice fishing and all that. We've got cultural events like the more than a century old a winter carnival in Saranac Lake with the ice palace, the iconic ice palace. These are things that tell us who we are and that the rest of the world knows us by. So we do have evidence that the winter is getting shorter and milder. And there are lots of independent lines of evidence. And one of the clearest kinds of thing that you could actually see with your own eyes if you spend a lot of time around here is changes in the ice cover on the lakes. So one of the ways we get this information for a lot of the lakes is actually part of the culture. It's ice out contests and sometimes ice in contests, but there's something psychological about waiting for spring to come after a long winter and uh, watching the ice on a lake or a river. And then even as a community gambling on when the ice is gonna go out. Um, so these things are common around the region and people keep the records of these because there's money riding on the results. So they're kept pretty accurately. Um, and then, you know, people wanna to refer to the past in order to place their bet for the coming year. So that was also done here at Paul Smith's College. Um, it was done when the Paul Smith's Hotel was here early in the 1900s and there was a break. And after the college got rolling, uh, starting around 1970, uh, we had ice out contests here too on Lower St. Regis Lake. Um, since then, because of the, context of climate change, I've been continuing uh, as well, even without the ice out contests. But uh, here's the basic chart from our lake, Lower St. Regis Lake, uh, 1970 to 2020. Um, the thaw is about 10 days earlier on average 
than when it started in the 1970s. So that'd be uh, uh, winter getting shorter on, on the end of it in spring. And it's also getting shorter on the other side and the freeze up side. So here's a 200 year record from Lake Champlain um, with the dates of freeze up of the main part of the lake between Plattsburgh and Burlington. And uh, you read it from the timeline from left to right from the eight, early 1800s. And I put an asterisk for every winter in which the main body of Lake Champlain did not freeze completely. So on the century scale, you look at the 1800s and there are only three times when it uh, was left unfrozen all year. And then in, in the 20th century, you see it becoming more and more common to be left with open water. And now it's basically normal not to freeze in the middle. Well, that's a pretty clear cut sign of warming as well. So winter is shrinking. Then we start asking, okay, well, what does that mean? Okay, so we hear a lot about temperature trends and rainfall trends and just in general, but to get down to the nitty gritty of what it means, you really gotta know a place and the people and the ecosystems there. And that makes us all actually experts more or less on what these impacts can mean, especially if you talk to other people. So for example, with the Lake Champlain ice story, I assumed ferry boat operators who run the boats between Vermont and New York there would prefer not to have the ice because then they don't have to break through and burn all that fuel. Um, I spoke with Russell Fox who uh, works there uh, with the ferry service. And he said, no, it's actually the other way around. It was counterintuitive. He said, uh, most boat operators prefer not to have the lake open in the winter because if you don't have the ice, you get these intense winter storms and strong winds and it whips up big waves and makes for a rough ride. And that burns up fuel too, and it's uncomfortable. And another thing which I hadn't even thought of was a great physics demonstration. He said, the, the more experienced uh, boat operators will also tell you they can feel the difference of winter waves on a crossing of Lake Champlain in the winter because it's colder, so the water is denser. So if you get a big wave slamming into your boat in winter, you feel the impact a lot more than you do in the summer. So there's a direct impact right there just on uh, daily life in the Champlain Basin. And of course, as you know an area, you know the, the story is not simply clear cut of just winners or just losers, it's a combination of both. So we kind of get to know um, who's likely to benefit and who's likely to be hurt. So for example, here with the uh, winters becoming shorter and milder, you could say, well, um, that uh, condition is a major determinant of survival of white-tailed deer in the winter, is uh, how severe the conditions are. So with milder winters, you might expect um, you know, more survival of white-tailed deer on average in the uplands over time. So if you're a deer hunter, you may consider that good news. If you're thinking about deer ticks carried by deer and other mammals with the Lyme disease and other illnesses, uh, you could think that's a problem. So of course, it's a mix of both, but we're the ones who are best equipped to find out what is going on and what these uh, benefits and harms might be. So just the cultural effects too go with this. Here in the um, upland forest, we had long ago, a tradition of you know, uh, doing a lot of forest harvesting in the winter because the, the ground would freeze. It's like automatic pavement. And people liked having sleighs to go on the roads because they weren't muddy anymore. Um, as that changes, of course, um, interactions with the woods will be changing as you get something more like on the left, when instead of hard frozen ground, it's softer. And that can change then the seasonal cycle of work in the woods. And of course, you know, you might think, okay, on the trade-off side again, uh, down in the Champlain Valley, right? We have a lot of apple growing and, and crops down there. Um, the changing of the climate, of course, can change the conditions for growing particular crops. So you could say um, some of the ones we're growing now might be uh, threatened by the ongoing warming, but also we're on the leading edge of other crops moving in. And uh, we, we definitely are getting better conditions for grape growing, let's say in the Champlain Valley. And maybe someday we'll have a nice fancy wine district too, like other parts of the world. 
Um, this was actually one of the things that Samuel de Champlain was watching for in the 1600s when he came through here, was looking for good locations and climates for growing grapes. So he was a few centuries too early. Okay, so that was talking about the shorter, milder winters. The flip side of that, of course, would be longer, hotter summers. And we're seeing that happen as well. And what does that mean for us? So here's a chart again with the um, temperatures by month. Uh, I put in green here the summer months, June, July, August. Um, you can notice that the, the bars there are not as high as the other ones, but there is warming. It's significant, two to three degrees Fahrenheit since 1970. So the winter warming is outstripping the summer warming, probably has to do with the weather systems coming in from farther north where um, the higher latitudes are also warming uh, faster on average than the rest of the globe. Um, so what are some of these implications? Well, one of them would be with aquatic habitats, um, the temperature of the water can influence the physical structure of a lake, um, the layering or stratification of the lake with warm water above, cool water down below, and also the chemistry of the lake uh, with the content of oxygen, dissolved oxygen, uh, having more of it down below, let's say, than above, at least at first, until it gets used up by decay and animals in it. So with a lake structured like that, you can also see then effects on the species who live in those different parts of a lake. So we have the so-called warm water fish like pike and bass, yellow perch up in the upper layers, and uh, let's say lake trout down below that like the cooler, more oxygen rich waters. That whole thing changes as the climate warms because then the summers get longer and hotter, the warm upper layers become more persistent and oftentimes thicker and warmer, expanding the habitat where you might get these warm water fish and shrinking the habitat where you get the cold water fish. And in some cases, you may actually eliminate the cold water habitat altogether. And also, if you isolate that lower part long enough, eventually the oxygen supply is depleted. And that also becomes untenable for the cold water fish, not just because of the temperature change, but because running out of oxygen as you're trapped down there in a longer, hotter summer. So we're seeing some um, effects of this already. Uh, we've had people maybe actually in this group right here today uh, have actually documented direct temperature effects on breeding and things. Uh, but in terms of the lakes and the long-term trends and what does this mean for management, um, I like to use this example of uh, what the Nature Conservancy is doing at Fallensby Pond near Tupper Lake. It's a beautiful, large, historic uh, property that they've got. And uh, they're considering uh, managing it in part as a climate refuge for fish. It's very deep and very large. So there's a huge, deep, cold, oxygen-rich reservoir in there. And it's got a, a large, healthy population of lake trout in there, the likes of which are really hard to find anymore today. And so um, the thought is that as lake trout are threatened in other lakes that are shallower and don't have that cold bottom there, um, as they're disappearing elsewhere in North America, partly from climate change, um, places like this will have extra value just because of their physical structure where they can um, sort of act as a buffer for species to help them get through this period. So of course, climate has you know, more to it than just temperature, right? So um, here are the precipitation records of those three stations I showed you around Paul Smith's Adirondack 3. Uh, over the last century, reading from left to right, um, the last 120 years uh, with total precipitation for the year. And again, you see an increase on here. And that's since especially the 1970s. Um, this is widespread through the Northeast. It's the opposite of what's going on out in the West. Uh, we've got a wetting trend overall here. Um, and that sort of fits to uh, one possible explanation is as the world warms, there's more evaporation from the oceans. Um, so more moisture in the air and uh, a more active atmosphere with the heat energy in it. So uh, more rainfall when it comes and uh, maybe more intense storms as well. We do have evidence of the storms becoming more intense. 
So uh, here's a photo from the town of Keene. If you remember uh, when Irene came through and dumped more than a foot of rain in a day over the high peaks, which funneled that huge amount of water suddenly down into the Osable Valley. It tore through this town here in Keene. These, these were former backyards in Keene that were destroyed by what's considered just a small brook now, uh, ironically called Hurricane Brook. Uh, but if you look at individual storm events over the last century and plot them out over time, like this graph in the lower right, uh, this again goes from 1900 through the century there. Each blue dot on here is a rainstorm event this one I think is from Cornwall, Vermont. I forget which station this was, but it could be Danamora. They're all pretty similar. Uh, anyway, you plot the, the number of inches that fell in a single day. And the higher up the dot is, the more rain fell in a single storm. And there's a statistically significant trend going through time of getting more intense. So it doesn't necessarily mean um, that we're getting more storms. It's that the storms we get are carrying more moisture and dropping more. And so uh, they're, they're becoming more intense on average. So that's definitely happening here. It's also seen in, in other parts of the world. It's part of the big picture. You can see evidence of this wetting trend that we're in on average. Um, you know, of course it varies year to year, but the overall trend is up. And you can see this even without charts. So for example, if you're out canoeing, hiking, whatever, around these lakes here in the uplands, uh, you'll see something like this at Bear Pond, where uh, you say, well, okay, what's the deal? Um, notice there's a tree growing out of water and there's tree roots growing out of the water. Um, and of course, um, trees don't sprout underwater, right? This means the, the lake has risen on average and is drowning the shoreline, drowning the roots. This used to be a little island in Bear Pond. Uh, some of you may know this, this place. Um, several decades ago, when I first came here in the 1980s, um, sometimes you would people would illegally camp on this little island, and there was a DEC no camping sign. It's still there on the tree, although I think the tree has recently fallen as well now. Um, so that's pretty clear cut evidence of uh, a wetter climate happening there. But there's other stuff too going on with the lakes, and that has to do with the clarity or the color of the water as well. So here's Bear Pond a picture I took back in the 80s. And here's what it looks like more like today. And there's several reasons for that. One is Bear Pond is an iconic example of recovery from acid rain. So part of this clarity back in the 80s, which was spectacular, it was like a swimming pool and beautiful, but part of it was it's basically kind of sterilized by acid rain. Um, and uh, my colleagues and I, you know, use uh, water chemistry records and sediment cores that document here in Bear Pond that the pH has recovered along with um, the pH of rain since the Clean Air Act was modified and passed. So this is a, an environmental success story, but the flip side of that is, of course, you know, it's not as clear anymore. So it's uh, not as spectacular for swimming. The other thing though, is uh, also related to the temperature and the amount of rain coming. So it's partly uh, murkier because there's more life in it, but there's something else going on with Bear Pond and other lakes in the area. It's called browning. And the deal with that is if you warm up the climate, you can increase uh, microbial activity in soils, in forest soils, let's say, um, by raising their metabolic rates. And also if you increase wetness, it can sometimes help the microbes decaying things and also wash their waste products down, downhill or downstream. So if you're, if you're a lake surrounded by, let's say a conifer forest, um, the leaf litter and debris on the forest floor is full of tannins, tannic acid, which is basically tea. And if you're warming it up, you're basically increasing the breakdown of that, releasing more of these organic compounds into the soil, into the groundwater, and then into the lakes. So it's basically um, forest tea discoloring the lakes as well, adding organic matter. And that can have chemical effects and temperature effects actually by absorbing more or less heat energy and affecting the oxygen cycling too. So browning is going on as well because of these two trends in the climate curve. And also, of course, um, if you lengthen summer and increase the duration and intensity of the layering of the lakes, so that the 
bottom waters start to lose their oxygen supply. Um, that in itself can not only harm, let's say, fish that require the cold, high oxygen conditions down below to get through the summer, but it can also make chemical changes in the bottom of the lake where uh, what used to be oxidized uh, mineral deposits in the sediments used to trap nutrition or nutrients like phosphorus into the bottom sediments and keep them out of the water. Um, when you lose the oxygen, you lose the rust, it allows more nutrients to escape from the bottom of a lake into the water and basically self-fertilize. Uh, it's like almost having, you know, a, a septic tank or a, a heavily fertilized lawn washing into the lake, only it's coming from the lake bottom itself. And if you do that, of course, then you have a higher risk of heavy growth of microbes that a lot of us would not like to have, including cyanobacteria, which can sometimes be toxic. And we're certainly seeing that Lake Champlain as well, uh, down in the lowlands, um, where you not only have more runoff carrying more phosphorus into the lake, but also um, longer stratification seasons causing the internal releases of these nutrients as well, and therefore increasing the risk of undesirable plankton blooms. So what's next? Okay, well, we can sort of speculate, uh, but if we do that, of course, we got to remember that um, it's going to depend on what we do as human beings, because we are now a major force of nature. We're a major force behind what climatic conditions are like on planet Earth. And so we're now in the process of deciding uh, how much more fossil fuel we're going to burn, how much more CO2 and methane we're going to release. And that will affect climates of the planet far, far into the future. But this century is going to be the critical time because we haven't burned all the fossil fuels yet. So we still have a chance of cutting back. And so um, I'd like to sort of move forward on this, just looking at what looks like might happen during the rest of this century based on what we do um, using two emissions scenarios. One is where we basically um, try to cut back from fossil fuels as quickly as we can to other sources of energy or just going ahead and burning it all as we have been. So um, several people have been looking at this kind of thing. Uh, here's one of uh, Jerry Jenkins's nice artwork here showing kind of today snow cover and uh, with the two emission scenario, what it could look like by the end of the century uh, for reducing basically winter snow conditions. So uh, Mary Phil and I did some work along these lines as well for the Nature Conservancy uh, a while ago. Um, we took 16 climate models that were downscaled to the Champlain Adirondack Basin and uh, spun them out under these two emission scenarios to the end of the century. And as you might expect, common sense would say um, in the moderate emission scenario, we get less warming than in the extreme one. Okay, then um, the models of course vary on uh, what they anticipate the actual amount of warming to be. But uh, you're safest if you just say, the extreme emission scenario has greater warming than the other one. Uh, but let's let's kind of look at this with a broad brush. So um, I tried to make some artwork here to sort of visualize what this would all mean. So uh, here's a chart of today, and then I'm going to show you what it will happen with these two scenarios. Um, this graph in the middle is meant to show you the months of the year and the temperatures on average from those three Adirondack stations. And so the curve kind of, if you read it from left to right, starts here with the summer I've got here and then dipping down into winter and the horizontal line is uh, zero degrees centigrade or the freezing. So if you just simplify and say, okay, winter is when the average temperature is below freezing and then summer is when it's above. Okay, so today it's not 50-50. Some people would say, uh, joking, of course, you know, winter and then you get one month of summer or something. It's kind of the opposite, right? But this is kind of what the seasonal cycle looks like here up to uh, a little below 20 degrees centigrade in the maximum in July. And then uh, the peak here would be uh, around January here, the coolest between five and 10 degrees, right? So if we have this trend, uh, what we basically did was take these climate models, take the average of the ensemble average and apply the predicted warming for the different seasons by the end of the century and applied it to this chart. So, 
next next one here. I got to click here. Here's the moderate emission scenario. The IPCC has used to call it the B1 scenario. All right. So um, the average uh, warmth of the summer peak in July is a little bit above 20 degrees now. It's a little bit wider on the year chart here. It's a little bit longer. And winter has gotten a little bit shorter. Um, these gray bars are the, the in-between seasons. So here would be autumn, let's say, and uh, there would be spring. So winter would be shrinking and getting shallower. So it's uh, not as cold in the middle of winter as before. So that's the moderate scenario. That's if we cut back from fossil fuels as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, what looks like so far is the more likely scenario is if we just continue pretty much as, as we've been going. And uh, here's more what it would look like. Uh, here we've got way warmer summers, longer summers. There's still some winter, but notice how short it is and also very shallow. Uh, the, the peak cold time in, in January here uh, would be um, on average less than minus five degrees. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, winter we could think of as a big old lake that's shrinking and shriveling and shallowing and drying out over time because of the warming. And this, of course, is only this century. Uh, what we're setting in motion here is um, lingering fossil fuels for centuries in the fossil fuel emissions for centuries in the atmosphere and oceans. Uh, we're very likely to lose anything close to what we think of as winter, if not by the end of this century, then in the next century, if we don't cut back. Um, also to sort of start bringing this down now to the Paul Smith's uh, area and what this could mean. Uh, this was a result of a student's um, GIS study with uh, Dr. Leanne Sporn, one of my colleagues about a ticks and Lyme disease, uh, basically using the temperature data and to uh, map out where a suitable habitat for um, deer ticks would be that carry Lyme disease. You know? So for the moment, the uplands are not as optimal as the lowlands, but by 2100, based on these model projections, it looks like um, we're going to be having more of this suitable habitat for deer ticks and Lyme disease and such increasing, which sort of fits common sense too. So the next thing is, okay, what does this mean for us, right? And a lot of people don't wanna talk about the subject because it can be so depressing, right? And how it's often presented is in ways that make you feel like everything's over and you just wanna curl up in a ball and forget about it all and just go shopping. Now you can't even do that because of COVID, right? But um, I wanna encourage you not to do that. This is not a time to curl up in a ball. This is a time to acknowledge what's going on. Uh, there's plenty of time to act and now's the time to do it. So I wanna recommend, if you haven't read this yet, um, Michael Mann, um, a well-respected, well experienced and articulate uh, climate scientist, and he's a good guy. He actually spends time in the Adirondacks too. Um, has a new book out, it's called The New Climate War. Uh, some of you may know his name. Uh, he's been attacked mercilessly by climate deniers over decades. And so he's really on top of the cultural implications of this. He says, um, one of the reasons not to despair is because that's what the fossil fuel industry wants you to do. To be giving up hope that anything can be done at this late stage and make it sound like all is lost. Well, that's not true. Um, so we do need to push hard for legislation to support alternative forms of energy and uh, reduce subsidies for the fossil fuels and make the switch as quickly as we can. Another thing that he brings up here and documents it very well is another strategy again, is to um, not invest as much in outright denial because it's just so hard to do anymore with the weight of evidence. Uh, the fossil fuel industry strategy is to get climate activists to fight among each other too, instead of having a united front. And one of the ways is, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of, is things like uh, travel shaming, uh, shaming over your diet. Oh, you're eating too much meat. Oh, you're flying in an airplane. Oh, you don't have a Prius all this stuff when the real focus should be, how are we gonna switch from fossil fuels? The large companies need to be held to account and help solve this problem. So I strongly recommend this book and strongly recommend not falling for the despair tactic that's being promulgated. Okay, so one of the things we can do is start by learning what's real. 
And that in itself is a challenge nowadays too, right? But uh, you need to learn what is true before we can really reliably do what is right. So of course, as scientists, we, we know that science is our clearest window on the truth. Um, and uh, so one of the things we can do is build this into our communities and our lifestyles. And as uh, academics, we can build it into our courses as well to encourage people to learn about what's changing where we live, not just some abstraction in the Arctic or the Amazon or on a weather chart, but what's really happening in places we know and care about where we can actually observe consistently. So, for example, uh, we've got at, at the Paul Smith College campus a phenology trail that's dedicated to a long-term monitoring of the phenology or the seasonal changes in animals and plants and the ice on the lake. Um, these data go back 30 years. So this is one of the things we're working on with uh, Brendan and Skylar, and hopefully we'll get it published this year. But uh, we're seeing, for example, um, the arrivals of the robins on campus, the migrations of the spotted salamanders in spring are coming significantly earlier since 1990. But interestingly, um, it's not consistent among species, especially among the plants. We're not seeing so much change. So those of you that follow this kind of topic say, well, that's interesting. There's a risk of ecological mismatches happening and things like that. Uh, but like, why is this happening? Well, we come back to the charts and we see in the spring pattern, if you go uh, March, April, May, uh, March and April aren't showing much warming at all. And uh, May's got a little bit. This is the, the least affected time of year, which is unfortunate in terms of a, you know, a cool scientific outcome in a way, because um, that's when people are most likely to keep these records of when did the robins come back? When did the ice go out? When did the flowers open up? Uh, but um, in recent decades, um, now that's since 1990 is our records for the phenology. Uh, we're not seeing a consistent change, at least among a lot of the plants. What we are seeing though, is uh, strong correlations with temperature. So even though there's not a trend in the phenology of the plants, let's say the maples at the, at the campus yet, it's pretty close to having one. And the dates of blooming of the red maples closely follow temperatures from year to year. So it makes sense then that we don't have a strong trend in the phenology because at the moment, there's not a strong trend in the spring temperatures. That then means that if you look at those climate models that I mentioned, they do foresee spring warming. And when that finally kicks in, and that could happen at any time, we can now anticipate that the plants are gonna change too. So we got the last season here. Okay, that's when actually the, the greatest warming is September. I mean, September is basically melting into summer now. It's adding an extra month to the summer. So there's six degrees of warming we get up here in the uplands uh, since 1970. Fortunately, we have a little bit of phenology information for that season as well. And again, um, this is built into our courses at Paul Smith College. The spring phenology is built into a climate change course where the students go out and monitor and add their, their findings to previous year's data about the birds and the plants and things like that. Um, fortunately, we've also got that going on in the introductory biology class here at the college. We have the lake on campus, there's the campus behind. And we have this promontory out here called the Point. Um, since 1990, um, we, because we have these hands-on outdoor introductory biology labs, the students have gone out when they're studying microbes to collect their own microbes, plankton from the lake. And as they do that, they also collect temperature. And so of course, you know, the, the data are somewhat questionable because different people are doing it over time and all this stuff, but we average those together through the whole semester. We keep the records. And then uh, in this case, as you can see from the evidence here, back in the 1990s, um, the average temperature students were getting out on the point was about 13 centigrade in September, let's say. Um, now, for the last 10 years, it's closer to 18 degrees centigrade. And of course, that fits with the temperature records from September as well. Uh, the surface of the lake on average in September is warmer than it was 30 years ago, um, with, of course, implications for the water quality of the lake and um, the oxygen concentrations. So I'll start winding down here. 
Um, of course, other things we can do if we're not doing long-term monitoring or you know, uh, putting this into our classes is, is of course, support win-win strategies for alternative forms of energy that can still power our civilization, still make large corporations rich, uh, but don't do this long-term damage of deranging the global climate in ways that, as we're finding now, definitely has impacts on the Adirondacks. So look for these win-win strategies and support them and subsidize them. Um, support people who are out doing things that need to be done. Um, I'm so inspired by the younger folks whom I interact with all the time with the Youth Climate Summit movement that started right there with uh, Jen Kretzer and others at the Wild Center in Tupper Lake and is now spread nationwide. Um, the Pro Snow movement. Um, and then of course, um, the faith community coming on board with um, things like Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment, care for creation. There's plenty going on um, in spite of the resistance from the large fossil fuel companies who want to slow this as much as they can to, you know, um, survive and, and uh, regain their investments as best they can. Um, so there's plenty to do. There's plenty going on. And uh, above all, um, we got to talk about it because people are uncomfortable. It's been politicized so much and um, we don't have to fight over this. Here's an example of Paul Smith's students going to the Fish and Game Club in St. Regis Falls to talk about climate change, which is amazing, but um, it's a long story on how to do this right. But uh, basically, rather than being confrontational and coming in and preaching, they were allowed or invited. They made a personal um, connection to the folks at the at the center and they ask, what would you like to know about climate change that would be of interest to you? Instead of dumping it on them and they said, oh, well, uh, hmm, deer and fish. So the students made presentations on that. What does it mean? And they, they were glad to see some of the results, you know, more deer maybe, but sad to see the trout going away. It was fantastic and they were polite and wonderful. The fish and game club was full. And for an hour after the talk, people hung around and talked with the kids about climate change, the environment, common interests, and all kinds of things. So that's really important too. We're all in this together and we need each other. So I'll, I'll stop there. Let's see, we have some Q&A and some chat. I, I don't know uh, how to get at that, but thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll need to sign out in like 15 minutes or something because I have to teach a biology lecture next, uh, but um, I'll, I'll stop screen sharing and we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Kurt. We've got, um, that was amazing. It was an excellent overview. Um, we've got three questions in Q&A and there are more coming in. First one from Stephen Bird. Um, he's curious about what explains the three or so months that have no temperature change. Seems strange, odd. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, this is a good group to actually ask about that. Like, it's easier for me to just sort of guess what causes some of these seasonal changes. And as I was sort of hinting there, uh, we know the, the higher latitudes are warming faster than the global average because of the retreat of the ice and snow, which amplifies the warming. And in the, in the winter, we get these cold air masses coming down from the north that dominate the weather scene. So if that region is warming more, you should expect winter to be warming. But, um, and then you can kind of have more southerly, southwesterly uh, systems moving in in the summer. So these transition times, I'm, I'm not really sure. I was Maybe somebody else would like to uh, chime in on the, I'm not sure how best to do that. Um, could they give you an alert somehow, Mel, or is any real uh, experts on the seasonality of this? What's, what's going on with the spring? Um, yeah, so if there's anyone, I can um, promote anyone from a participant, if there's someone in particular you would like. Um, the other thing we can do is add that to the Q&A that we'll be yeah. able to afterwards. So if anyone has things they would like to do, I'm trying to see that we've got two attendees that have raised their hands, Michael Krauss and John Rosales. Yeah. Okay, so let me, I'm going to allow John Rosales to talk. <laughs> so John, you, so John, you, you have insight into the spring stuff? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, uh, I think a place to start would be to look at the jet stream, which is now wavier than it used to be. Uh -huh. The jet stream now is coming down over southern Greenland, and uh, we're oftentimes caught on the north side of that, that big dip. 
uh, into February, now March, your data suggests it's March too. Uh, I think it's lingering into March, but that might be a good place to start. Yeah, thanks. So position of the debt stream. So the next question, of course, would be, how come it's not doing it in the fall? <laughs> You know, the transition times, you think they might be mirror images of each other, of each other similar mirrors, but they're the opposite. If that's the warmest is September. So it's like, oh my gosh. But part of the September thing, of course, it's it, that way outstrips the warming in October and November. So it's probably just the simple thing of the summer getting longer and bleeding into September and therefore raising the average. Thanks for that, John. Okay. Michael Krauss, did you have anything to add? No, just uh, at the beginning of the uh, session, it looked like you were speaking, but uh, you were muted. So I just. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So the next question then is um, Is there any evidence? I'm, I'm not sure I understand this one. Is there any evidence showing a reduction in watershed height? Oops, I just lost your voice. Uh, watershed height is out there. Yes. Um, not sure, Lynn. Could you explain that? What do you mean by the watershed height? That's a term I'm not familiar with. Okay, so we'll come back to that one. I'll, I'll yeah. check in. Okay. Um, Doug Burns has a comment. Um, one interesting and counterintuitive change you didn't mention is that for a period at least, climate change will likely result in greater freezing of soils in the winter because of the diminishment of insulating snow cover. This has implications for tree roots and the soil microbial community, among others. Eventually, if the climate warms enough, this increased soil freezing problem may diminish. Yeah. Yeah. There'll be a lot of these changes going on. And that's the great thing, you know, with a little bit of good solid information of, okay, what are the real changes going on here? Like these charts of the, the months, you know, when people who are experts in their field there that are aware of what the ecology of the forest or a pond or a field or something like that, or the cultural effects are the experts on what that's gonna mean. So uh, yeah, that's, that's really an interesting insight that uh, as you warm the winters, you can get greater freezing depths if you lose the snow cover, the insulating effects of the snow cover. And of course, that's got impacts on, on uh, animals too, right? That sub zone there where they're hiding, the like the rodents, let's say, um, under the snow. And depending on that nice fluffy insulation to have their little tunnels, if it starts thawing and melting more and not having as much insulation, um, that can be a real problem for them. And then that can affect the food web as well for the predators. Yeah. Lots of implications here. Excellent, okay. So the next one, um, Toby Harmon, um, he says, I, Kurt, I worked at the Wild Center this past summer. Are you aware of the development of their new climate change exhibit? They're attempting to focus on ADK climate stories from locals. I think this presentation touched on a lot of that. Oh, I've got to check that out. No, that sounds, the Wild Center just does amazing work. So yeah, I totally want to see that. Thanks for the heads up. Um, so then Lee Keat asks, could the heat dome affecting the West reappear here? Um, so you're, there's a long-term uh, thing going on here. I'm not sure of the mechanisms that are causing the drought in the West. Uh, if someone else is more up to the mechanisms there for the West, maybe you'd want to speak up on this. Um, I don't think... Well, it's hard to say, right? It's hard for any of us to say what's coming because this is a no analog situation. I mean, we ha we do have climate cycles. That's kind of my specialty, right? Looking back centuries, thousands of years and seeing repeated patterns. But with this human influence on top of boosting the greenhouse gases and changing the albedo of large parts of the world on top of those mechanisms, we really are in uncharted territory. So my first response to Lee was, well, you know, typically our climate systems, our climate inputs here in the Northeast are so complicated. They literally come from almost every direction, less simple in a way than the Western ones. I don't foresee a prolonged, uh, you know, a prolonged drought. But then again, uh, with the waviness of the jet stream, if something blocked those waves and held them in a certain way over us long enough, we could get wicked droughts too. Uh, in our paleo records um, from Adirondack Lakes, we've actually found evidence of that happening sometimes in the past lasting decades 
uh, several centuries ago, there were some pretty intense droughts here as well, that they were not on the same magnitude as the ones out west. Um, it was between the medieval warm period or medieval climate anomaly and the little ice age period, that transition. Uh, we had some pretty intense droughts here too. So yeah, um, I don't wanna say it couldn't happen here. Okay, great. Um, next question, do longer shoulder seasons mean more ice storms? Oh boy. Yeah, if the shoulder seasons, yeah, that's a good point. My first guess on that, I was asking that myself and those of you that lived through some of these ice storms we've had. Um, they're nothing new in the North Country. We have evidence of them going back more than a century. Uh, my first response was, well, if they're more common in a shoulder season, um, the shoulder seasons aren't necessarily changing that much. Um, they're just moving around, bracketing the winter and the summer. But if they do get longer, yeah. And if we get to the mild enough winters, where the whole winter is like a shoulder season, then that could be a real problem for ice storms. So you might anticipate that more by the end of the century and into the next one. Okay, um, next question. If organisms like robins are appearing earlier, are there food supplies available at that time? Are food supplies also appearing earlier? Yeah, so that's one of the really crucial things people who study phenology are worried about is uh, it's called ecological mismatches or phenological mismatches. Uh, let's say if uh, birds are breeding and they're insect eaters, um, if the insects are um, shifting when they come out in the spring relative to the birds and responding in different rates, the, the young birds may not have enough insects to eat, let's say, or things like that. Um, we see some evidence of something like that perhaps starting to happen, nothing clear cut, but we have been monitoring um, a pair of species where that might be a problem. And it's the uh, native bees that live, they burrow in the ground on Essex Hill, uh, Calides inequalis is the name. They collect pollen from the pussy willows, sometimes the red maples, but mainly the willows. Um, they've been coming earlier in the spring. They've been emerging earlier in the spring. The willows have not been producing their pollen earlier in the spring. Right now, the difference in the timing is not all that great, uh, but there's a possibility of a mismatch going on if this trend continues. Okay, so um, the next one, Justin Minder says, thanks for the great overview. Can you comment on the approach you used for downscaling in the Champlain Basin study? Did this change the results from the CMIP models much? Do you think further work on downscaling, for example, capturing lake effect snow and terrain effects better is a promising area for future research? Yeah, that's a great question about the downscaling. So um, this was uh, a project with the Nature Conservancy and they actually hired people to do the downscaling. So um, we took the results of the downscaling. Um, from what I've seen from CMIP and everything, um, the results aren't that radically different. But one thing I did learn was that uh, while you increase detail when you downscale like that, you don't necessarily increase accuracy. So, um, and the results you get depend wildly on which model you used as well. Uh, we saw, um, especially with precipitation, which is really, really tough to get. So uh, temperature is easier to do. Precipitation is really, really iffy. Um, just on the level of, let's say, you can have a thunderstorm here and the next town over is dry. There are so many factors that go into whether the moisture in the air precipitates or not and where it goes and things. So I actually ended up, although I was impressed, I ended up backing off a bit from uh, trusting exact values from climate projections, especially downscaled ones, um, and sticking with the broad brush stuff, which a lot of it's common sense. It's nice to know that the models pretty much back that up. Um, actually, one of the other um, error sources, by the way, with the downscaling too, is the smaller your pixels and the smaller your area, the fewer weather stations you have to verify what you're thinking you're seeing as well. So yeah, they're great, uh, but you got to use them with caution. So I'm not that excited by more models doing more detail. That's my bias. <laughs> Okay, so we have one last question then. Are you or any others seeing any changes in runoff patterns with the increasing intensity of storms? 
Oh, that would be great. I, I'm not monitoring stream flow, but maybe somebody in the group is. Does anybody have any actual data on them? Um, oh, actually, you can get river discharge. Um, that is definitely increasing on average, but on the scale of individual storms, I know some people monitor that. Is anybody in the group able to comment on that? Uh, specific attributions of increased runoff due to particular storms? Maybe we can put that in the on the website. I've, yeah. I've got to start doing my students. <laughs> <laughs> we can um, put that on the website. And if anyone has any information they'd be willing to share, um, yeah. you can send it to um, me. You've, you should all have the link from to my email. Um, I'll also be sending out a link to the recording for this presentation as soon as it's available. Um, and Kurt, make sure to check out in the chat because there's tons of thank yous for doing this and, and accolades. And for everyone, there's some great resources that people have um, put up in the chat also. So I, I think since there's um, no more um, questions right now, if any more come in, you can also just put them in Q&A or you can send them to me. Um, but otherwise, we'll let Kurt get to class. <laughs> and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you everyone also for attending. Awesome. Okay, bye-bye. Goodbye.